Hey everyone, it's Peter Kerr from Rock Daydream Nation, and I've got Reed Little back to the channel. How are you, Reed? I'm doing great, Peter. As always, I appreciate the invite for another fun chat. Been looking forward to this one. Absolutely. So the whole concept of this show is we are going to choose a Desert Island Blue Oyster Cult album. The album that we love the best from the discography of Blue Oyster Cult, the one that we would take to a desert island. Maybe I'll throw it to you, this first question. What was your first impression of Blue Oyster Cult, the band, in the day? Oh, well... Probably like most people, it, they didn't make a huge impression on me. I had heard Don't Fear the Reaper on the radio, and I'd heard Godzilla on the radio. I don't even know that I knew those were from the same band, but I knew those songs. Um, so really, my first dedicated encounter with them came on the soundtrack to Heavy Metal, The Motion Picture, um, now, they had attempted to contribute multiple songs to that soundtrack. They wrote songs that were about the storylines in the movie. And uh, ironically, the company ended up not using any of the songs that were about the movie in the soundtrack and instead took a completely unrelated song called Veteran of the Psychic Wars, uh, which... As anybody who was a D&D playing nerd in the early 1980s knows, that song is every D&D playing nerd's favorite Blue Oyster Cult song. It, it just it went like wildfire through the role-playing community. Uh, it's loosely based on the lyrics of Michael Moorcock. Uh, well, I'm sorry, it is Michael Moorcock's lyrics. It's loosely based on his concept of the eternal champion. Um, and... That, I thought, was just an amazing song. And then after that, I saw videos for Shooting Shark and Take Me Away. Um, but it wasn't really until college that I had a friend uh, in 1986 who was a big Blue Oyster Cult fan, and he had the full album of Fire of Unknown Origin. And I went, oh, this is the album that has Veteran the Psychic Wars on it. And uh, after that, I was all in on the, on the Blue Oyster Cult. Nice. Well, my first impression of Blue Oyster Cult was I had a mate at school and his brother had a, an amazing heavy metal hard rock album collection. And in this album collection, he had a big swag of Blue Oyster Cult. And I used to pour over the album covers because they had the most grooviest album covers, symbols, weird setups, very mysterious. And I was really intrigued. Don't Fear the Reaper got a bit of airplay in Australian radio, but other than that, not much. I had an awareness that they did a tour with Black Sabbath in the day just through Kerrang! magazine. I'm not even sure if it was Kerrang! magazine, but whatever um, sort of music papers that I was reading at that time, I, I, there was an awareness. And there was actually a movie that was playing in cinemas in Australia. It had a cinema release. But other than that, not much. I've only really deep dived into Blue Oyster Cult over the last 10 years. And over the last five, I've really become passionately a fan of this band. So great opportunity to get a, another co-fan onto the show. And so Reed, first and foremost, what is the album that you would take to a desert island? And I'll flash up my album as well. So this is this was a really tough choice for me uh, because I have, as as Martin Popoff sometimes says, my heart says one thing and my head says something else. Uh, and as I mentioned in in college, the album that really got me into Blue Oyster Cult was Fire of Unknown Origin. And pretty much any time prior to the last four or five years, I would have brought this one out unquestionably. But now, as I have listened to a lot more non-heavy metal music in the last decade, as I've gotten into 60s and psychedelic rock and some of the older rocks, uh, that album has been replaced in my affection by Secret Treaties. Nice. So one of the so early this is, BOC albums. If I could only grab one, some people call it the Black and White Trilogy because uh, they all had the black and white covers. But uh, if, if I could only grab one, this would be the one. 
Okay, well, the album that I would choose is the Martin Birch produced Coltosaurus Erectus from 1980. So, all right, well, Reed, why don't you spotlight the first song off that album and state your case, why you would choose this as your Desert Island disc? Okay, well, for one thing, uh, Fire of Unknown Origins is... Now, whether whether this is you think this is a sin or not, it's a very 80s album. The production on it is very 80s. Uh, it's very much of the time. And early 70s rock does have sort of this timeless quality to it. So I don't listen to this and instantly get reminded of the early 80s when I was listening to the album. For one thing, I wasn't listening to this album when it came out. I'm not... Even, I don't remember exactly what year this came out. The writing is too tiny for me to read. Um, But I love so many things about it now. Uh, For some reason, deep BOC fans tend to say that Tyranny and Mutation is the album where they really hit their groove. But for me, it's this one. Uh, And paradoxically, they hit their groove by absorbing all of their uh, influences. There's a lot of garage rock sound on this. There's a lot of psychedelia. You can hear Jimi Hendrix and The Doors and The Grateful Dead, early Alice Cooper, uh, MC5, like that Detroit garage rock sound. Um, And yet they put that together with probably the weirdest lyrics of their entire career. The lyrics are all over the map on this. Um, You know, there's... it has a love song, if you want to call it that, uh, in dominance and submission. Um, you know, it's it's got story songs, sort of, but they're more like fever dreams than a uh, than a plot that has a beginning, middle, and end. Um, so it's musically interesting. It's lyrically interesting, and uh, I love the way it opens with "Career of Evil," which is one of the more conventional sounding songs on the album. It has this great little line, do da do 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 Um and then the lyrics really match the title. The guy's talking about all of the evil things he's going to do. He's going to kidnap somebody and, and ask for ransom and then take the money and, and keep I think he says his sheep. He's gonna keep his sheep. He you know he, he wants to have sex with this guy's daughter and, and all of these other Things they had to uh, um, censor that when they played some markets. Um, instead of I want to do it to your daughter, they would say I want to do it like I oughta, which is <laughs> pretty cheesy. But Fire people words. were uh, were sensitive about such things, um, and it just it, it's groovy. And again, it has that garage rock sound. Um, and it really just drives home that whole BOC feeling. I think it encapsulates that album really well. Nice. Well, yeah, it's it's a very strong album. Well, firstly, I'll just t- explain this lineup that has done this album is the classic lineup of Eric Bloom, Donald Buckdama, guitar, Eric Bloom being the singer, Joe Bouchard on bass, Albert Bouchard on drums and Alan Lanier on keyboards. So the classic Blue Oyster Cult lineup, first song, which is Black Blade. This is the songs about the misadventures of an unfortunate man who is linked to an evil blade. It holds a power over him and he uses it to kill people. So this is a science fiction um, story co-written by Michael Moorcock. It was really interesting. Like in those days, they didn't have internet. So the the lyrics would have been exchanged by mail. So back and forth a couple of times. I think they're playing on this is very assured. Um, Buck Dharma's playing is subtle. It's clever, melodic, and there's enough riffage to satisfy the classic BOC fans, the ones of the black and white era. Bouchard's bass playing is melodic. I like Albert Bechet's drumming. It's steady. And he does these nice little patterns that just weave within the riff. 
I love the outro, how it sort of gallops and builds up to a bit of a steam. And then you've got that synthesizer voice coder, which was very much typical in the late 70s and early 80s. I think this sort of typifies why I like this album so much, because it's this album's very melodic, but Martin Birch got them to do to rediscover their deeper hard rock groove to go back to that sort of style of music. There is some AOR, album oriented rock or American oriented rock, as we call it in these parts, but there's always a little bit of bite. And the lyrics across this album are so sharp and they, they kind of laugh out funny when you read the, the concepts and the storytelling of some of these songs. Um, it's a cut above the rest, but I'm going to go with Black Blade as the first song that I'd like to spotlight because I think it's an outstanding opener and it really draws you into this, the world of Blue Oyster Cult in this album. Right. Which, now this is, I'm, I, I just want to talk about that for a second because I think it's fascinating that that song did not break through to the D&D playing nerd community in the same way that Veteran of the Psychic Wars did, even though they're both lyrics by Michael Moorcock he also did a third song, Fire Clown. Um, or no, I'm sorry, The Great Sun Gesture. The Great The Great Sun Jester uh is a, a is a song with lyrics by Michael Moorcock. The Fire Clown is a story by Michael Moorcock. It has the Great Sun Jester in it. Um and the song is about Elric of Melnibene and his demon sword uh, Stormbringer. The song that gave the Blue Oyster cult or excuse me, dog on my head today gave the Deep Purple song Stormbringer the name Stormbringer. So uh, it was really in the fantasy mindset of the time. I guess maybe D&D just wasn't popular yet because this was still in the, in the late 70s. It wasn't, it wasn't, when did this out? When did Cultosaurus come out? 1980, yeah. Okay, so D&D was being played, but it wasn't super popular yet. D&D sort of, hit its straps in the mid 80s or late 80s from memory anyway yeah um one more fun fact after the there's a bit in the song after the laughter of the Stormbringer. if you turn up the volume apparently you can hear a voice say you poor fucking humans so that's just uh, something for the the listeners if they want to turn up the stereo and hear a little bit of a that sort of line all right yeah, okay What's your next track? Okay, uh, next, I'm, uh, I'm going to pass over the song Subhuman. So, uh, Secret Treaties is notable for having a couple of songs that are taken from uh, Sandy Perlman's Imaginos concept. And Subhuman is one of those, but it's also one of the few songs that I actually really like the version that's on the Imaginos album better then I like this one. Uh, I think because the version on this album, you just you, there's no context for it. It just seems like another weird song. So I go, well, that's that's kind of strange. Uh, but you have to love dominance and submission. It's such a strange song, apparently uh, taken from a story in Sandy's actual life, where he was in Times Square and caught a cab ride home. And there were things going on in the back of the cab that he was in. Um, but the lyrics are so bizarre. And I still do not understand what the lyric radios appear refers to. I, I, I don't understand that in concept. Uh, I don't, knowing the backstory of the song doesn't help. It's just this like complete non sequitur to me. If anybody knows, put it in the comments. I mean, enlighten me. I, I would love to know. But... Um, it's so catchy. Um, say in Times Square, people do the polka, dominant submission, radios appear. And uh, it's, it's weird and catchy and wonderful. And it's such, uh, only Blue Oyster Cult was doing this sort of thing in the late 70s. Yeah, look, I think that sums up Blue Oyster Cult, doesn't it? They're sort of on the fringes lyrically, but it's just, yeah, they're so sharp and witty and weird. I think you summed it up perfectly. Talking about another weird song, lyrically, Monsters. This has a hard rock riff, real deep groove. It's kind of got a little bit of an Alice Cooper 
Detroit feel to it. So Martin Birch's production, by the way, is really speak. It's vibrant. The separation of instruments is just nice, nicely balanced. And this song, you know, it goes into this rock riff and then it'll go into something that's kind of eclectic jazz, into an eclectic jazz jam. That's Blue Oyster Cult, where at a drop of the hat, they can just change time signatures or go into a different style of music. That's what makes them such a wonderful band. The right. plot line to this story in this song is a group leaves Earth on a sta- spaceship and there's four guys and one woman. One of the guys falls in love with the woman and finds the woman with the others and in a rage shoots her. And there's a reference in the lyrics to Joe. Joe Bouchard, Joe, let us know. Why did you get picked on in these lyrics? He subs to the channel, so I'd be interested to know. But it's high energy. It's got a bit of a barroom boogie feel to it. Uh, But just the lyrics are just wacky. And I I just think it's just a fun song, Monsters. That's my pick for spotlighting. Do do you know, was that one of the ones that uh, Helen Wheels wrote? It was written by Albert and Karen Bouchard. Oh, all right. And uh, um, I want to make sure that, uh, that I'm leaving my absolute number one pick room for it. But I, I do want to talk about ME262, which, so that's, that's the, the plane on the back jacket, the uh, Nazi war machine, the Messerschmitt 262, which is a rather unusual um, topic for an American band. Now, in the uh, the mid-70s was not so far past World War II that people were yet willing to accept things that were written from the German point of view. Um, and I have to think that this song was at least a little controversial at the time because the entire viewpoint of the song is from a German fighter pilot. Um, and they go into the whole thing, must this English, or, yeah, now, now I'm, I'm getting it turned around in my head, must the Englishman live that I die or something like that. Um, I should have read the lyrics again. I was listening to this song earlier, but now it's kind of tangled up in my head. And uh, this song has legs, though. When I saw Blue Oyster Cult on the, the Symbol Remains tour, they still did it live. Uh, and the audience loved it. And there's this part where uh, Buck Dharma is at the, or not Buck Dharma, uh, Eric Bloom's at the front of the stage pretending to shoot a machine gun because they've got like some machine gun noises. And uh, the whole audience just loved it. It was it was a big hit. But we're a lot further from World War II now. Um, and that type of imagery was really frowned upon, uh, at least in the United States. So I just, I don't know how people felt about that song. But from from this far down the road, it's pretty easy to just take it as a piece of fiction. I'll, d- I'll do a quick counterpoint to that. There's a song on the album Cultosaurus Erectus called Divine Wind. And it's about the Iran hostage crisis of 1980. And there's references to the devil, you know, um, this one. Uh, Eric would announce this song on the the tour as this one's for Ayatollah Khomeini. However, when you read the lyrics and reading interviews with Eric, he's talking about the perception of Iran and other countries, how they see America as the devil. So it's similar to your song where it's doing the perception of the other side, not necessarily at face value, a song about the wrongs of, you know, the Iranians and the hostage crisis and Ayatollah Khomeini, even though on stage that's how he presented it, but the lyrics sh- kind of um, provided a bit of a counterpoint. But that's not my song. Um, I wanted to, just to do a little bit of a counterpoint to what you were saying. Okay. Um, deadline. So that's got one of uh, Joe Bouchard's best bass lines in all of the songs. It kind of anchors it all in. I love the acoustic guitar, the drums, they're all hooked in. And Eric Bloom just sings this sweet, not overly emotive vocal line 
it's just in the right place. I think this has got some of the most subtle, beautiful guitar bits of Buck Dharma. He is so underrated, Reed, seriously. And he does all these little subtle licks across the this song. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Mark Knopfler of Dire Straits at his best. It's kind of a little bit AOR, but it's got a little bit of bite to it. The song, the lyrics are about an old friend of the band called Phil King, who was, used to book Blue Oyster Cult in co- small clubs. He was murdered as a result of messing with organised crime and not paying up. So it's got a very dark and sinister storyline to this song, but it's sort of wrapped up in this this kind of a very sweet, melodic type of gentle um, Blue Oyster Cult song. So that's the thing about Blue Oyster Cult. I, I always talk about bands like this, like Trojan Horse, where on the surface it sounds all very sweet and melodic, but when you scratch the surface there's a little bit of edge and there's a little bit of darkness. And that's what I think is prevalent across their whole catalogue. But I really like this song, especially with Buck Dharma's guitar playing. I would love to hear some isolated guitar line tracks of Buck's playing across an album like this or, or your album. It'd be wonderful to yes. hear. Uh, I think Buck, the best thing about Buck is that as the band went on, he adapted and 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 grew because uh anybody who listens to hard rock knows that there were certain milestones in hard rock you know bands that were playing in 73 74 did not have to be super technical and then after van halen 1 came out in 1978 you know hard rock bands were expected to have the best guitarists out there the really flash guitarists and uh, Buck was very much a 70s type player. He was, uh, um, or really a 60s type player. He was very, um, I said, he combined sort of the uh, the jazzier side of, of uh, Rob Krieger from The Doors with the ability to throw in licks like a Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead. But as the 80s went on, he really picked up and became a much flashier player. And he always kept up with his peers, kind of no matter what the state of the music scene was. And that was probably out of necessity to keep up with the gunslingers in town because se- subtle 70s guitar licks probably didn't cut it in the 80s. So may have just been out of necessity. But uh, I look, I think he's totally underrated, very melodic. And a lot of the outros on this album... Where they place the guitar solo in, in a lot of these songs is kind of towards the end of the song, outro, right? not right in the middle. So they're breaking the conventions all around Blue Oyster Cult in their arrangements. Um, is that something that you find maybe in your album, that some of the arrangements oh. you're, you're listening to it and you're thinking, oh, that's, that's something that I wouldn't have done, but it's interesting. It's just a kind of an off-field choice. Well, they, they do a lot of, especially on, on side, what would have been side two of the album, they do a lot of fade from song to song. So it feels like almost a continuous story from Harvester of Eyes to Flaming Telepaths to Astronomy. Um, and that, I think, again, was more of a 70s thing. But, you know, that, I'm just going off the top of my head here, but the 70s were kind of the decade of, of the outro solo that you just don't hear that in contemporary productions. Uh, and maybe it's be, it makes you wonder how many great solos were cut, cut off halfway through because they're like, okay, that's enough of that. Fader's down and uh, you know they just print 30 seconds of it or something when maybe the guy was soloing away for a couple of minutes. I don't know. Yeah. The guitar player that always comes to mind is the king of the ad- outros is a band that you may not like, uh, Journey, Neil Sean. I've always thought him oh, no, to be yeah. masterly in doing those outro solos and how they are, do their arrangements, it's always geared towards the end. Even Richie Blackmore in some of the more commercial songs, like the singles, he'd always leave the little guitar lick or the the solo right at the end, like Since You've Been Gone, as an example. But, um, yeah, it's right. just interesting. The, the choices that Blue Oyster Cult make are not sort of straightforward. They're a little bit off kilter, and it makes for a, an interesting listen. All right, mate, what's your next, huh? next pick? 
Okay, so uh, I'm going to go over to what would have been side two. And uh, I always have to bring up, I mean, I could, I could do every song, but I'm going to do uh, Flaming Telepaths. Because, again, we're talking about a song that you, when you listen to Blue Oyster Cult, especially if you're a lyrics person, and I understand that not everybody pays attention to the lyrics. Uh, and definitely, I mean, the lyrics are strange enough that I don't have the memorized snippets, but I do pay attention when I'm listening to the album. And lyrics matter to me. Uh, and this song, again, is so weird. It's such a strange story. And it comes back to this, The um, it starts off as rock, and then it goes into what is, I almost think of like like a Broadway show tune. Is it any wonder that the flaming mind... You know, you can imagine people on stage dancing to it. Um, and they get back to this repeated refrain, and the joke's on you. And they just, they do that over and over again. And I think, uh, well, the meaning of a lyric is is really more in the mind of the listener than it is the person even who wrote it. Whatever it means to you, that's perfectly valid. But I have read people that have interpreted that to be completely literal. They are saying, audience, the joke is on you because you are reading these weird lyrics and think they mean something, and they don't. They're just song lyrics. It's just for entertainment. And if you're looking for deeper meaning in things like Harvester of Eyes, uh, no, it's, it's just a song about a guy who harvests people's eyeballs. And a cheap shot at Supreme Court Justice Abe Fortas, which is... Uh, I think Blue Oyster Cult may be the only hard rock band to uh, uh, verbally attack a Supreme Court justice in one of their songs. If you don't yep. know, uh, Abe Fortas said that he had, uh, I think it was, he didn't go to Vietnam, I, maybe it was Korea. But anyway, he, he, he wasn't drafted because he had ocular tuberculosis. Uh, which would mean t tuberculosis in your eyeballs. I don't even. I'm not a doctor. I don't even know if that's a real thing. It sounds made up. But they mentioned that in the song. There's a lyric about that. But um, said I. I love that. It's so weird. It just comes out of left field. You have this like Broadway show tune music, and then and the joke's on you, and you just kind of go, oh, maybe maybe the joke is on me. If well, you take it was, too seriously. It was the era of the rock opera in the early seventies. Tommy, Quadrophenia with The Who, Jesus Christ Superstar with that more Broadway orientated sort of rock opera. Yeah, I'm this gonna, would be um, more Rocky Horror. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do the Marshall Plan off Cultosaurus Erectus, which just sort of segues off your um, song choice because that's a very much a, a rock opera type of song. It tells a story of Johnny being a wants to be a rock star. He's a teenager, takes a girl to a concert. The girl runs off with the band, but he becomes inspired to be a rock star himself. And the lyric, it tells a story, but the lyrics talk about the perception of being a rock star and the actual reality, which is a lot rougher and a lot tougher. This is a wonderful song. And it's interesting because it's got a snippet, five seconds. It probably comes in the the boundaries of uh, copyright of Smoke on the Water. So I wonder if what Richie thinks about his riff being encapsulated as the essence of rock in the Blue Oyster Cult world. I like it. It's a rock opera. It tells a story. It has key changes, inserts of Deep Purple. I, I kind of... Always think of Alice Cooper. There's a lot of Alice Cooper in this album, that sort right. of style, that sort of Detroit. And this is one of those uh, songs that really reminds me of Alice where he gets a little bit more Broadway. But you know how there are some songs that go too Broadway and they push it too hard and it gets a little bit kitschy? It always sort of reins it in on the right side. But um, And I, I like the spoken word where he goes, here's Johnny, you know, right. reference of Johnny Carson. The same year that The Shining came out and Jack Nicholson, here's Johnny. So that was a catchphrase in 1980 everywhere. The yeah. Marshall Plan, and I like it, like it a lot. 
And of course, the Marshall Plan, a very provocative title, again, referring to just post-World War II, the reconstruction of Europe was the Marshall Plan. But this time they're talking about Marshall amplifiers. So a great little play on words in the title. And that's Blue Oyster Coal, two meanings or three meanings. Yeah. Yes. I often think that Blue Oyster Cult really were too smart for their own good. Um, I don't think that most of the rock listening public actually <laughs> wants high intellectualism from their bands. Uh, and I think that probably turned off some people. The critics love them. And that's the sort of music critics. they like. So your David Frickies, the um, Lester Bangs, Rolling Stone NME, they love them. There was a period of time with Don't Fear the Reaper where the public caught on, but they were probably not focusing too much on the lyrics, more of the riffage, more of the musicology. The lyrics yeah. were like secondary, but I've always thought this band is equally as important. It's a synergy between music and lyrics. Lyrics and music are equally as important. What do you think? You know, no, uh, well, one, yes. Um, I, I think if you're going to have lyrics in a song, they absolutely matter what the lyrics are. Uh, and of course, Blue Oyster Cult had so many different lyric writers. The ba the guys in the band did write lyrics. I mean, you know, yeah. Buck Dharma did the lyrics to The Reaper. Um, and they took some lyrics from Sandy Perlman, and then they had um, Richard Meltzer? Meltzer? All of a sudden, yeah. I'm forgetting his Patty last Smith. Name. Patty Smith, who went on to be a you know a punk rock icon in the CBGB scene, he had Helen Wheels, um, again Michael Moorcock, you know Eric Bloom and the Bouchard brothers wrote lyrics. They they just had so many lyricists, um, and I think that their outside lyrics or their outside lyric writers, it wasn't like, you know, when Aerosmith brings in an outside lyric writer, it's a song doctor who's writing them this schmaltzy ballad to get lots of radio airplay. Correct. Where when BOC brings in outside lyrics, it's somebody like Helen Wheels writing about a guy being forced to tattoo this drunken guy under fear of being killed in Tattoo Vampire. So I think they just felt free to go, BOC is a weird band. We can bring lyrics about anything we want. So you get a, uh, a very different palette than you do with some bands that work with outside songwriters. Indeed. Folks, uh, watch my interview with Joe Bouchard. He does go into the lyric writing and the process of, you know, collaborating with these great writers. So it's worth checking my interview with Joe Bouchard, if not already. Yes, you absolutely should check that out. Um, one of the other things I really like about BOC is they have three guys that are functionally able to be lead singers. So Eric is my particular favorite. I think he's the most rock and roll of the singers. He handles all the biker rock type stuff, the more aggressive songs. You have uh, Buck, who has the sweet voice, and Buck does like the, the songs like The Reaper or uh, Burning For You, um, which is funny because he's, he's such an aggressive guitar player. But as a singer, he's really... Um, well, he said sweet. He's very AM radio as a singer. And then you have Albert Bouchard. And uh, Albert doesn't have the best voice, I think, his, uh, but he fits the music. And he's close enough to the sound of Eric's voice that you can hear these tracks and go, that's, that's not the same singer, right? There's, there's something different I'm hearing. So it provides an, an added layer of interest. And I think that Albert really embraced the really weird lyrics. Uh, Eric liked the lyrics that had more overt stories. He liked doing the lyrics about bikers. He liked doing the lyrics about violent encounters. But Albert really bought into the whole, um, the weirdness, the Cthulhu mythos, the Imaginos story that Sandy had loosely worked on. And he was the one that brought all of those elements really to the fore. Um, and of course, uh, I can't get out of this album without mentioning what is easily my favorite Blue Oyster Cult song of all time, which is Astronomy. Um, the last song on the album proper, although my reissue does have four bonus tracks. 
uh, making it quite a bit longer. And uh, I can talk about one of the bonus tracks because I love it and I hate myself for loving it. But Astronomy is one of those songs. It's a great composition. It starts off with piano, of all things. Um, it's very soft. It's not very aggressive. And then he goes into this really weird set of lyrics that if you just read the lyrics, the clock strikes 12 and moon drops burst out of their hiding place. I mean, it just, you're like, what? What? You know, none of it makes any sense. I know you'll soon be married and you'll want to know where winds come from. I'm like, I don't, I don't think that's what married people are actually asking. Unless you have a very unusual marriage. Um, so it's just this complete psychedelia. It's like a dream, but it just builds and builds and builds. And they add this, there's this groove in the middle, the first solo where the band's going, hey, and Buck's do 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 And if you compare that to the version that's on the Imaginos album in the 80s, you get to the solo and it's a shredder. Where the guy's playing 16th and 32nd notes, it's very fast. And compare that to this solo in the 70s that's slow, it's eighth notes, it's groovy. Um, it was just a style of music that no longer really fit the musical landscape in the 80s, but it's so wonderful. And then they have that part at the end, which is my favorite piece of any Blue Oyster Cult song, where they really roll back. It just gets back to piano again, and the volume goes down, and then it swells back up, and they just go, astronomy. Oh, I just love that part of it. And I can listen to that over and over and over again. Um, but again, if you're looking for, for meaning in these lyrics, and people will pick out little pieces of it. Oh, he talks about the light that never warms. That's the moon. Moonlight doesn't warm people. Uh, yeah, you know what? The joke's on you. Because the lyrics don't mean anything. There, there may be snippets of things in there that mean something, but uh, I think deep fans have a lot of fun looking for connections that really aren't there in the lyrics. Maybe that's one of the things that people like about it, but a lot of it's just nonsense, but it's fun nonsense. This is why I think this band has such a fan base, because the fans are look pouring over the album covers. They're looking at the uh, the lyrics trying to get meaning what does it actually mean what's this album cover trying to say it, the symbol it's just the whole mystery of this band it's, it's wonderful it's a wonderful experience They're, and you can understand why there's such a connection between the band and their their fan base yeah hungry boys i'm going to choose this song because it's nervy it's got a post-punk feel to it it's even new wave energetic it kind of reminds me of a song that maybe the tubes or devo would do and do with a plom but blue oyster cult are doing it and it just shows what an eclectic band this this band is they've got a very broad musical palette i love the guitar playing i think it's a rhythm and i'm not sure if it's dharma buck dharma or eric bloom I had the headphones on and it's in the right speak, you know, the right headphone and he's playing these chords, but he's just behind the beat. And it, it's such an irregular, unorthodox way he's playing these chords. It's just slightly behind the beat, but it just sort of matches the material perfectly. So this is the sort of band where their arrangements are quirky and they're unorthodox. And I love how there's a piano note a single note that's sort of used through the duration of the song. And it's it's not using the piano as something uh, melodic. It's using it the piano as a percussion instrument. And pianos are percussion instruments anyway, but it's just playing this single note and it just drives it all along. And I wrote down here, king of the outro. There it is. Right at the end, got this searing little guitar lead break right at the end, which is a kind of a tasty morsel for the for the fans. But Hungry Boys, I really think this is one of their my favorite songs on the album. Reed, have you got some more honorable mentions? I've got a I've still got a few that I wouldn't mind I just, having a bit of a yap so about. It's, it's such a short album, but I'm going to talk about the uh, the bonus tracks. Um so on the version I have there are four bonus tracks. 
which interestingly, they, they don't have the names of the bonus tracks printed on this sleeve because it's a reproduction of the original sleeve. And, you know, until I, I read it in uh, Martin Popoff's book, I'd never really even noticed these dead dogs here by the plane. Um, but I will say, although I do like lyrics, I pay very little attention to album covers. I've never been an album cover guy. This is one of the reasons I don't do the album cover shows over on The Contrarians. Um, they're like, hey, we want to do this thing on album covers. I'm like, that's that's not my thing. You guys, you guys go talk about that. We might edit um, that and, out. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that I would have picked up that that these dogs are dead on this tiny little image. Um, but uh, there is a bonus track on here called "Mommy," and it starts off with this great da 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 da. Said this is a song about your mother. Your mother! Da, 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 da. And it's the most misogynistic. Um, I mean, I, I presume it's done um, jokingly. But even so, it's about how much his mom and daughter and wife piss him off and he dreams about murdering them in all of these ways. Uh, and it is, it is unrelentingly catchy. And it is the biggest earworm on this album. I love astronomy, but astronomy does, is not an earworm song. It's, a, it's an experience song. But mommy sticks with me after I'm listening to it. And every time I finish listening to it, I have to go, sorry, mom. Tongue firmly in cheek. That's all I've got yeah. to say about that. Folks. <laughs> Paul and Angel. I think that the vocals on this particular song remind me of Roger Daltrey. Roger Daltrey had his foghorn gravelly best. It's sort of, in that bat out of hell biker it's a biker tune tales with biking there's always a bit of a bike a one one or two biker songs on most albums i love the spongy spacey keyboard lines which were very popular in the 80s and dharma's uh guitar lines cut through another song i, I want to do a quick mention is lips in the hills this is one of the heavier songs on the album it's a straight out rocker the guitar is actually God on this particular song. So the arrangements are all geared, you know, bowing to the guitar work. Bloom singing with authority and he's got this nice little reverb. Now the lyrics are quite interesting because at face value, the lyrics may be about Roswell, incident, UFOs, but there's another interpretation. It could be about sex. So a lot of these songs with Blue Oyster Cult science fiction or sex it's you choose your own adventure when you read the lyrics right. so that's Very that's it's so. open to your interpretation um all right well what's your final 2024 assessment of this album compared to the so, boys to cult i think that this album has really held up um it's i said it, it has songs that they still do live it really still represents what the band stands for, um, just in terms of the weirdness of it. Um, it involves, if you are somebody who is into the Imagino storyline, story and there is no Imagino storyline. It, it was a couple of very uh, dispersed bits of lyric that they took, and but people have kind of made it a storyline, and now Albert has done, I think he's put out all three albums, right? He did Reimaginos, and then he did uh, two sequels, continuing the Imaginos story. Uh, I have not heard them. Um, but it's got everything that a Blue Oyster Cult fan might want. Uh, and it, it sounds amazing still. So great rock and roll. It is a little bit, I said it's a little bit psychedelic. It's a little bit 70s in its presentation. But I think that at this point in time, that is not something that turns people off anymore. In the 80s, we weren't that interested in like late 60s, early 70s type music because it was the old music. But now I think it's it's timeless. And classic, classic rock is timeless. I love this album because it's such a broad palette. Garage, bit of psych, hard rock. New Wave, post-punk, it's got it all. I think the band sounds inspired, the production's sparkly, the songwriting sharp, 
the lyrics, wonderful. I think this is the album that sums up the Blue Oyster Cult experience for me. There are a number of albums, including yours, that are right up there. But um, this is the one. This is the sweet spot for me. And I've always liked the album cover. I know, you know, the calcified alien dinosaur. And then you've got this weirdness on the, the back of the cover, whatever this means. I just think it's a, it's I a do great lo- album. I do love that album cover. Now, uh, do you, I know that all this is, this is not actually necessarily part of the, of the uh, discussion. What do you think about the production? Because Martin Birch did both of these albums, one right after the other. And to me, it's kind of the same thing with Black Sabbath, where you have Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules, and they sound very different. I agree. So what, what do you think about the production between these two? Yeah, one one's more sparkly than the other. How does this happen? Same producer, same band. Did they use a different console? Did they use what, what did what? How did they approach things differently? It's a, it's a bit of a head scratch. Mob rules, heaven and hell. One's muffly. One's really sharp and clear. What's your yeah. theory? Yeah, I I think it was changes either in Martin's philosophy, because those also are about the same time that he did Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules. I mean, they're, they're right in that same space of time. So I think he was evolving very rapidly. Um, or you might think of them as practice runs for moving over to Iron Maiden, because by the time he gets over to Iron Maiden, his, his Iron Maiden albums had a very uniform sound until he gets to uh, somewhere in time. But yeah, I think well, it was evolving, or maybe the technology was evolving just that fast. Look, in my interview with Joe Bashad, he said that Martin Birch was kind of not a, an interventionist sort of producer. He would just sort of say, that's a take, like that. He wasn't like really hands-on. He was sort of a bit sort of laid back. So this sort of adds to the mystery of Martin Birch because – the guy has got his fingerprints on, you know, the foundation or the the scriptures of hard rock and heavy metal. But yeah. there is some wild inconsistencies between, you know, even look, you look at a Rainbow, like the first album, Rainbow, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. It's a little bit sedate. It's a little bit not really clear. And you compare that to some of the other works that he's done with Rainbow or, for, you know, other acts. It's sort of like night and day. White Snake, those early White Snake albums, it looks like he was just having a cup of tea. And, you know, David, you just lay down the tracks. There's no real sort of, doesn't seem that there's a lot of work that's been done on the production. Even the bottom end, it just sounds very muffly and and very compressed. But Deep Purple, his work with Deep Purple, um, what's what's that album? Your one of your favourite ones? Uh, Who do we think we are? It's right. wonderful. It just sounds so sparkly and modern. It, it sounds like he's, he's spent a lot of time on it. It's just a re- real head scratch how somebody that's had such a long career has had wild inconsistencies on his output. But his work with Iron Maiden was fairly consistent. Would you agree? I do agree. Yeah, I, I really think that towards once Maiden adopted him, and of course, at that point, he pretty much said that this was it. Iron Maiden was his last band, and he just he was only going to produce them. So maybe that provided him more consistency. Uh, and I wonder how much impact budget had, because clearly not. You know, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. To me, that album just sounds cheap. I don't. I don't think Richie had much money to spend on that. Whereas by the time they did Rising, it's so lush and it sounds so good. You think somebody put a lot more money into this album than they did that first one. Yeah, it's it's kind of laid back and it's a little bit, it sort of hangs back. It's not as vibrant as, as Rising. But Birch with these other artists seems to have an inconsistency in a short space of time between albums. Right. Is it? To do where the producer, what's happening in his life, 
whether he's invested in one project and the material more than the other? I don't know. Was he more invested in the material of mod rules than he was invested in the material of heaven and hell? I, I don't know. I'm just putting theories out there. It's strange. And and he did not do a uh, a biography uh, or an autobiography. I would have loved to have read more stories, but he uh, he passed away without giving those to us. So he he will remain a mystery. Well, there's a lot of folk alive that have worked with him, and I think he deserves to get a documentary or somebody to write about him because, as I said, he has had his fingerprints on the scriptures of hard rock. And surely they can put a bit of a narrative about who was this guy, what was he, he like. So um, anyway, that's an interesting thought. Well, thank you, Reed. One more question. I always like to throw right. one. What's a Dark Horse Blue Oyster Cult album that folks should get into that you like that if you had a, a chance to sneak something a little bit, you know, a bit of a roughie on your uh, desert island, what would you bring along and tuck under your arm? Um, I think I would go with Spectres. Um, it's not as outside as something like uh, Fire of Unknown Origin, which is, is very much, I say, I call Fire of Unknown Origin the strangest AOR album ever made. Um, and in fact, I, I think it probably was the final nail in the coffin for any sort of commerciality for Blue Oyster Cult because people heard Burning For You and they thought, oh, what a great song. And they bought the album, and then they got Joan Crawford has risen from the grave, uh, which is much more typical of BOC's output. Whereas Spectres, I think, is a lot more narrow in focus. You don't have those extremes. Uh, it maybe doesn't have their... Uh, to me, those extremes are where you find the fun in Blue Oyster Cult. And it's that, that reason is why Spectres is not my favorite album. But it's more consistent... Uh, and you still get the full experience, and there are some great songs on it. Well, that's my pick as well. You might see it at the the back, um, propped up oh. against the TV. So that's my one that I'd also tuck under the arm. So that's a that's a good pick, Reed. Yeah. All right, folks. Uh, you can see Reed Little on the Contrarians. Just type in Reed Little. Please like and subscribe to Rock Daydream Nation. Click the bell. Plenty of stuff in 2024 about rock. More Blue Oyster Cult to come. We love this band on this channel. Please put your comments. Feedback is appreciated. Tell us what your favourite Blue Oyster Cult album is, your favourite song, or what do you think of our picks as the Desert Island is. But one thing's for sure, you'll see Reed Little and myself doing more shows in 2024. See you later. Cheers.